believe that we could somehow settle global conflicts through protracted negotiation and diplomacy when we know it's never been done, it probably will never be done, and we do so without any evidence because we believe in the triumph of peace. That is Jewish messianism. The Jews were the first to speak of great men not slaughtering each other with swords but beating their swords into plowshares. This goes back 2,500 years. So when we take religion, we say it's always about violence. And religion is always about, about saying that you're not saved. That wasn't the Hebrew prophets. They weren't perfect. And Christopher will be able to bring many examples where the Bible commanded things that are, to me as a man of faith, utterly inexplicable. And it's very painful to try to understand these things. And we've addressed these in other debates, or I've tried my best to address them. But to say that atheism is a panacea for all of this, and it's, and it's perfect, come on. Uh, it's a different debate, I don't want to go into it. But we all know that secular atheistic utopias killed more people in the 20th century than all the ro world's religions combined. Okay, uh, Mao killed 30 million, Stalin, I'm sorry, Mao killed probably 40 to 50 million, Stalin about 30 million, Hitler 12 million, Pol Pot 3.5 million. Excuse me, I could, okay, whatever, I could go on. Now, Hitler, now, 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 Christopher says in his book, yes, but it wasn't done in the name of atheism. That doesn't make a difference, because Hitler sort of thought that he could say who should live and who should die, quite literally. They would sit there with a finger and they would point. And a religious person would say that should be reserved to God. Do the, are there those who abuse religion? Of course! What I've learned from my debates with Christopher is this. Believe it or not, and I will say something that I know is on the record, and I am not a Jewish secularist. I am a profoundly and proudly orthodox Jew who prays three times a day, eats kosher food, will fast on Yom Kippur. But I will not embrace, nor will I preach, a false idea of religion that has done so much harm to religion. I state here emphatically, without any fear of refutation, that my Islamic brothers and sisters serve the one true God, and they are my brothers. That my Christian brothers and sisters serve the one true God, and they are my brothers. That Christopher Hitchens, who doesn't believe in any God, works for humanity, points out hypocrisy on the part of those who deserve to hear it. Religion needs strong critics. And he serves the cause of humanity, which for me is sort of the same thing, because I think God loves his children more than he cares about himself. And the very first rule of the Bible, Leviticus 19, is to love your fellow man as yourself. What does Maimonides say about the afterlife? He says that, that there will be a resurrection, and then everyone will die. Interestingly, he's the only one that says it among the Jewish sages, and we will live in all eternity after the Messiah comes, uh, in a disembodied state in heaven. Nachmanides disagrees with him, Christopher. He says that when you die, yes, there is an abode of souls, because there is a soul. But Nachmanides says, Rabbi Moses ben Nachman, that although there's an abode where the eternity of the soul experiences the bliss of being in the divine presence, ultimately those souls will be, as you said, resurrected in bodies because it is only this world that matters. It is the justice, the righteousness, and good deeds in this world that matters. You don't have to accept that. If you're a person of faith, you're going to believe it as an article of faith. Einstein didn't like that chaos. Einstein wanted what Christopher wants, this world which seems to be ordered purely by reason. But it turns out that Einstein embarrassed himself in the last decades of his life because he rejected the truth of quantum physics. He, looked, he searched for a unified field theory, really began to undermine his scientific credentials, never really contributed to science after the age of 25, because he couldn't accept that the world was chaos, complete and utter chaos, that it couldn't even be measured, that it, didn't even, it wasn't even subject to the rules of mathematics. I try to bring reason to the world, but I am humble enough to admit when I don't know, or when things transcend knowledge. Never once in my debates with Christopher Hitchens have I ever said, this is so because the Bible says so, or this is so because I believe it. When we debated God, whether I did a good job or a bad job, my argument was that based on my limited understanding and having reviewed as much of the scientific literature that I can, because I absolutely believe in science, it does not seem to me that mathematically there is a strong probability that life could have evolved of its own accord. And I've looked at the math, and it, that, I still retain that attention. I've looked at the anthropic principle, so many other things that seem to show that the world has a unique precision that would defy um, an accident. When I debated Christopher on whether we need God to be good, I believe that unless you have some divine authority that says it's always wrong to murder, human beings will always find a reason to murder, including religious people who will use whatever they find in religion to justify their own reasons for murder. But I'm not going to murder. I disagree with Christopher's opinion about settlers being the cause of Middle Eastern conflict. I believe in the Middle East, it's my opinion, that right now it's Hamas and Hezbollah. 
funded by Iran. And I know many settlers, but let me tell you, and many settlers, and the vast majority of settlers that I know are people who just want to live in peace. And yes, they believe, not, not just in the divine nature of the land, although there are those who absolutely believe in that, but mostly they believe that they've tried peace, it hasn't worked, so now Israel has to hunker down and just control strategic points. Many of, those, many of them are there for that reason. Many of them are secular, by the way. But let me just tell you, when Baruch Goldstein killed 29 Arabs the, on Purim Day, the happiest, most celebratory day of the Jewish calendar, my house was firebombed that night. It was a uh, Spanish au pair that saved my children's lives. I said that day that Baruch Goldstein, some Jews, some tiny minority excused what he did. They said, the guy snapped. You know, he was treating so many of his friends who were stabbed to death. You can't blame him. He used to treat Arabs too, and he did. But he snapped. And the others said, no, no, he actually had intelligence that the Arabs of Hebron were going to attack the settlements. So he preempted their murder by striking a blow, you know, the doctrine of preemption. I got up in front of the national TV after my house was firebombed and I said, Baruch Goldstein, I'll say it right now, although it'll disappoint some Jews, and I've been criticized for it heavily, strongly. Baruch Goldstein is a cold-blooded killer, an abomination to Judaism. There is never an excuse to kill someone who is innocent, ever. The only excuse to kill is in self-defense, period. If someone wants to take your life. These were 29 innocent people who just wanted to pray. I say that on what? Based on the religious authority of God saying, do not kill. And when my Palestinian brothers and sisters turn to me and say, but come on, Shmuley, we have to do suicide bombings because we don't have helicopter gunships. We have to strike back because there's all, all these Israeli checkpoints. Okay, I hear you. But let me just tell you, your religion also says do not murder. Ever. Even when you have checkpoints. The Jews were subjected to, let me use the classic British understatement, the Jews had a rough time in Nazi Germany. But they never blew up nurseries. They didn't resort to blowing up buses. They never used that as an excuse to punish innocent children. And I say that to my Arab brothers and sisters, based on the religious authority that you cannot kill. Religion does have an application, but I gotta tell you, so does atheism. I wrote an article about, about Christopher's illness, I told the story of Rabbi Zusha of Anapoli that he told his students, one of the greatest Hasidic masters, he said, atheism is necessary for faith. And they were about to tear their clothing. They heard blasphemy. Atheism is necessary for faith? He said to them, every time you see a, someone who's hungry, someone who's naked, who needs clothing, your first reaction as a religious person is, there's a God he'll provide. You're supposed to doubt it sometimes. What if there is no God? What if I am the one who must stand in God's stead? We need intelligent critics of religion. My whole problem with Christopher Hitchens has simply been this that he finds no redeeming qualities of religion at all. You can criticize the Catholic Church. What happened to the pedophile Pelias scandals are disgusting, abominable. But are you gonna criticize an organization that runs the largest network of orphanages, hospitals, and schools in the entire world? Are you gonna say it's all bad? You can criticize religion. Are you gonna say it didn't inspire Martin Luther King's message of racial harmony? He never had any title except reverend throughout his entire life, period. Every speech he gave was quoting from the Hebrew prophets who spoke of a time when human beings would live together as one people with one tongue, sharing one hope. That wasn't an atheistic vision. That came two and a half thousand years ago, as I said, from the Hebrew prophets. So my issue with Christopher is not that he has very legitimate criticisms of religion that I myself would, art would articulate. Because I don't believe in perfection. I believe in struggle. I said it before. It's why Eden and paradise have no appeal to me. I want a place where I wrestle with my conscience to try to do the right thing. Heroism is found specifically when there's two sides and you have to triumph, one over the other. Especially not slaying dragons outside of you, but the demons that live inside you. But to say it's all bad is like coming along and saying that all atheists are terrible and they only poison. And that was said by religion for thousands of years, that kind of religious hypocrisy. So no, I am not a secularist at all. And yes, I absolutely affirm a belief and I have no evidence and I say it openly because I'm not a liar. There's no evidence, even, even Dinesh D'Souza's argument, which is interesting, he said it in our debate in Puebla, that, nine, that uh, uh, physicists now admit that 95% of the universe is dark matter. We don't even know what it is. Maybe that's heaven. Well, maybe it is, but that's still not evidence. Some people say there's, when you believe, many scientists who are atheists believe in extraterrestrial life. Why do they believe in it? Christopher said that science is about hard evidence. We don't have the most, a scintilla of evidence that there's any life on other planets. Nothing, zero, and yet we spend billions with uh, radio satellites and probes looking for this thing and there isn't a scintilla of evidence. You may as well look for heaven, it's the same thing. 
In fact, more people probably believe in heaven. But again, I accept his argument about evidence. I believe in an afterlife, the way the relig religion describes it. I believe in paradise. I believe in all those things because I'm religious. And it's, it's the foundation of my life, these beliefs. And yes, they don't always lend themselves. And they're easily ridiculed. I agree. But there are many things in life that do not lend themselves to evidence. But, that's not, that's, but, that, but what I'm saying is, none of this is ever emphasized in my faith. None of it. Jews almost never discuss the afterlife. This world, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, giving hope to the hopeless. That's why religion, Judaism is such a this world grounded religion. We actually say that this world is the one that matters. There's nothing secular about it. So your vision of religion is not the one that I buy into. But thank you very much. Sorry I went on. I think that um, having, so to speak, invented the toxin of mon monotheism, it's a wonderful thing that Jews have been the greatest contributors to undoing it. Um, by means of discovery in every possible field of endeavor, beginning with the great first Baruch, and then when he changed his name, Benedict Spinoza, who was the, the first one to see through the idea of a creator God, a personal God, one who answered prayers, one who made special covenants with different tribes, and all this and other... Um, Delusion and for his pains was very, very horribly expelled and bullied out of his synagogue in Amsterdam and pelted around Europe by all the Christian powers who for once agreed with what the leaders of a synagogue had done by way of putting an end to free thinking. And we still don't know whether we have as much as half of what Spinoza actually wrote, a lot of which had to be in code. But from that great tradition, which, which t picks up from that of Lucretius and Epicurus and Galileo. Um, to move on to Marx, Freud, um, Einstein, and others, is to have, yes, done, a, done a, a, a tremendous work of the mind against superstition. And yes, it's true, and I'll, I will I'll concede this to you. Of the three monotheisms, Judaism makes the least up of the afterlife. I mean, there are two words for hell that we have, um, Sheol and Gehenna, I think, are the least two that are Jewish religious words. But they, there's a great deal of argument about what you need to do to get there, and uh, whether you're in the same chemical composition as you were when you were who you said you were. And yes, I'll give you this too. Jews in some way look forward, I would not say it's completely in the material world, they look forward to supernatural events in the material world, such as the little child leading the predator, or um, in some versions, the lion lying down with the lamb. Well, you remember Woody Allen says, well, maybe the lion will lie down with the lamb, but the, the lamb won't get much sleep. <laughs> in other words, it's, it's, it's still expecting supernatural results in the natural world, which to me qualifies as religious. Of course, there could be an afterlife and no God. That's quite possible. There could be a devil and no God while we're inventing supernatural entities. There could be a hell and no heaven. That's all quite possible. There could be a God and none of these. They're all contingent. Why? Because they're all so obviously man-made. Now, in that, I don't see, granted this, what is meaningful in the statement that one is religious anymore. Um, to say a couple of words, mildly in defense of the Marxist conception of history, at least, well, it grounds itself on the idea that there is no supernatural dimension, that the material world is sufficient explanation for people's motives. And as Marx writes very brilliantly in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, um, religion is the sigh of the, the, sigh of the oppressed uh, creature, uh, the spirit of the spiritless situation, the heart of the heartless world. And criticism of it has, as he says, uh, plucked the flowers from the chain not in order that we shall wear the chain without consolation, but in order that we may break the chain and cull the living flower. And yes, to that extent, I'm willing to defend that conception of history and, and philosophy. Now, it's a, this doesn't mean materialism sounds bleak, or, or may be made to sound bleak and arid and reductionist. It doesn't mean there's no room in our conception for the numinous or the transcendent if you wish, or the ecstatic for what's experienced in music, love, landscape, solidarity, other, I think, human and natural phenomena. Um, if I'm asked 